Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 19 of our supervision curriculum series. And today we are going to be talking about program development. So in our last uh, topic, we covered assessment. And after you conduct an assessment, then the goal is that you are going to write up a treatment plan or develop the programs that you are going to be using to teach and help support the learner to gain skills that you identified in the assessment. So it's important to identify the correct assessment, but then to also use those assessments, so probably not just one, to identify um, socially valid goals, goals that are meaningful for the learner that are going to improve their um, life and improve their interactions um, and, and provide supports in areas that they need and want supports. Um, you also take into consideration um, parent and caregiver uh, priorities and goals, but not to the exclusion of what is best for the learner. Um, but you take into consideration all of that information and then you're going to identify, well, what are we going to work on? Um, now, how much you target and, and how many goals you have is going to depend upon a variety of things. Um, one is going to be uh, the age of the learner, um, their availability, um, the nature of why you were brought into this. Is it just to target a, a subset of skills? Is it a comprehensive treatment plan um, that's going to address everything? Um, and uh, and figuring out how to prioritize and teach um, maybe some pivotal skills to start with and then build upon those as you go. Um, as a general rule, um, I have worked with um, primarily um, early intervention, um, so preschool up to late elementary school, age 10, maybe. I've worked with older um, individuals uh, than that up to age 19. Um, but uh, primarily my work has been more of the early intervention side. And with that, if I am starting with a brand new learner um, who is getting comprehensive services, I probably would have about 15 goals for a, a 25 to 30 hour a week type program. And that's just what I have found that works. Um, there's gonna be a wide range. There's gonna be a variety. It definitely depends upon the learner and what skills they have and what support needs they have, but um, as a rough idea, because I know sometimes that gets questioned like, well, how many programs? Like, well, it, it is going to depend, but you know, if you choose only five programs and you have the learner there for like in a clinic based setting for 40 hours a week, um, you're going to get really bored of those programs. Your providers are going to get bored of those programs. Your learner is going to get bored of those programs. Um, so you probably need a little bit more variety. However, if this is a learner that you're going to be serving like after school in a social group for, um, you know, a few hours a week, maybe three hours a week, um, having 20 goals, you are never going to get through all of those 20 goals. So you need to focus it down. So what are the goals, right? Um, the skills are divided into categories based on similarities and general curricular ideas. Um, funders, so insurance companies or the school district often specify what areas need to be upset, assessed and targeted. Um, so, if you um, have a funder that's specifying, here's the areas 
that we want to know. Um, so for example, uh, military, US military insurance used to have a list of 10, I think, domains. And we were to write um, what needs there were in each of those domains. So they gave us kind of a framework. Um, a, the school district has areas that they um, identify, and those are the areas that then there need to be goals addressed for those areas. Um, under the medical model for autism treatment, um, those categories are related to the characteristics that lead to the diagnosis of autism. So communication, social skills, and behavior. Um, however, the domains um, of the skills may be specified by the assessment in that you use to identify those areas of needed support. So you might go by the categories of the ABLES or the VBMAP or the Vineland, um, whatever types of assessment you used, you might use those categories to divide up your goals so that it matches quite well onto the assessment. Um, again, for the purposes of uh, maybe funders that are reading it and need to see how directly it's linked. Um, in my experience, um, this is very flexible, right? You just need to be responsive to whoever you're turning in the paperwork to, right? If it's funders, then you want to follow their categories. Um, if it's uh, uh, if, if it's like a private pay situation or it's the learner themselves or their family, I find that linking it directly to the assessment makes it really easy for them to then see the assessment results and see exactly how that translates. So on this assessment, here was an area identified as needing more supports. So now I'm going to put this as, you know, an area we're going to work on, and then I'm going to delineate, you know, our targets underneath there. So this that I'm going to go over here <laughs> is um, a, a breakdown of eight areas. Um, this is uh, not pulled from an assessment directly. Um, this is more just a, a breakdown of skills into sort of different groups. Again, you can break them down into a lot of different ways. Um, this is certainly not the only way to break skills down or to divide them up. But for our purposes, we're going to identify eight areas. Um, and those eight areas could generally cover just about any skill I think that you could come up with. Also, in practice, I found that it kind of doesn't matter what domain you put things under because sometimes there will be skills that could fall into a couple of domains. Is this communication or is this a social skill? Well, it's really both. So maybe you could put it into either domain or maybe you would create a domain that's communi social communication skills, right? Um, that piece is generally um, something that has some flexibility. So you really just need to be responsive to who you're writing the report for. Um, all right, so one of the first areas we're gonna talk about is imitation. So imitation, uh, the basic skill is that the individual would copy something that an adult or peer does. Um, there might be an SD or an instruction like do this or copy me. Um, however, there are some things that we don't uh, use uh, an, an instruction for those skills. Like if everyone is um, laughing at a, a, a joke on the TV, then maybe um, we would want our learner to look around, see the people are laughing, and they would also laugh. Maybe. Not always, everybody doesn't find the same things funny. Um, but there might be cues like that where you see someone doing it so you follow what they're doing without somebody saying, copy what this person is doing. Um, there can be motor imitation with objects or without objects. You can have vocal imitation. You can have peer imitation. You can have gross motor imitation, fine motor imitation. There's a lot of different examples. Receptive language. So this is 
<laughs> more of a topographical label as opposed to a function or, or verbal behavior model label like manned, tact, um, interverbal, echoic, etc. Um, but I also think that this is an opportunity where you could bridge some of our language. A lot of people understand receptive language. You receive the language and you act upon it. It's like following directions, right? Um, and then you could intersperse other behavior analytic terminology if that is important for those people that are implementing to learn that terminology. So in this case, we're calling it receptive language. Um, examples, it might be following directions. It might be um, uh, receptive labels, like uh, where's the cup, give me the shoe, uh, touch your head. Um, it also could include attributes or abstract concepts like um, prepositions, um, adjectives, adverbs, those types of things. Um, how the individual is able to respond and understand and demonstrate that they understand those concepts or understand what is being communicated to them. Sort of the, the flip side of that is expressive language. So this is the individual expressing something. Could be vocally, but it also includes the use of um, AAC or other um, signs, like anything, um, how, how they are able to communicate. This is where a lot of your manding is going to come in. Um, they are able to ask for what they want, um, or communicate what they want. They might also be able to answer some questions um, or comment on. So this might include man's tax and interverbals, um, whereas imitation included your echoics. Um, so expressive is is communicating um, back out what they need. Um, motor skills. So the focus when we talk about motor skills is actually completing the task, not necessarily completing the task under some sort of uh, criteria. So I might be interested in can the individual uh, physically put small items into a jar? Do they have that fine motor skill? Um, not that they do it when I tell them to. That would be receptive label. Do they, can they follow an instruction? Um, motor skills we're talking about physically, are they able to perform a certain task? So can they tie their shoe? Not will they tie their shoe when I want them to tie their shoe, right? That's a different, that's a different skill. This is just motor skills are just physically looking at um, can that motor skill be performed. Pre-academic and academic skills. Um, so these are things that might be like ready to learn type skills, getting an individual prepared to be successful in a school setting. Again, coming from a, um, an early intervention background, that's a lot of the goals is like our goal is to get you to where you can be in the gen ed classroom or be in a classroom with some supports. Um, and then you can access all of the learning um, that way instead of needing additional supports to access learning opportunities. Um, there might be academic skills that we are supporting. This is also where I would say like executive functioning skills might come in, um, you know, learning how to organize or how to prioritize. Um, those would be things that I would put in this category, but other people might pull it out and, and have executive functioning separate. So again, the, the categories are often based on who you're reporting to, but for our purposes, pre-academic or academic skills um, would uh, vary, again, considerably. The instructions might be instructions from, uh, from an individual telling you uh, what to work on or what to do next, or they might be more independent work type skills. Uh, the next category is social skills. Uh, so social skills would be those type of interactions um, with peers or with uh, community members or other individuals. Um, 
in a, uh, a setting where there's not necessarily a specific, um, well, honestly, it could be if there's specific goals, like work would also be a social setting and you would need social skills when you're at work. So this is one of those where it's like, isn't practically everything a social skill? Like, yeah, could be, um, but there might be some that are um, more specifically identified as, as a social interaction type skill that someone would like to target. Um, oftentimes these don't have a specific uh, instruction that someone's giving. It's occurring in the environment and we want to help the individual to identify those naturally occurring cues and then respond. Um, this could include eye contact. Eye contact is one of those though that honestly, there's so much variability um, across cultures, across people that um, it could be a target, maybe, depending upon the learner and the situation, um, but it probably should not be a, a top priority um, because even individuals who make fleeting eye contact are still generally able to get by without it causing some sort of um, great concern that people used to think that it would. And again, like I said, culturally, um, there's a lot of differences in when you make eye contact and when you don't make eye contact across cultures. So identifying eye contact um, is, is sort of a, uh, a Western culture focus and honestly probably doesn't need to be targeted. In, in my experience, I, I don't target eye contact um, specifically anymore. It's, it's just not something that serves a function as much as maybe being able to communicate without eye contact or respond to show that you are attending um, instead of having to make eye contact. So that was a side tangent. Next set of uh, domain of skills would be play skills. Um, so these might be play with peers. This also might be sort of the independent play or leisure skills. Um, is an individual able to engage in um, items or activities for enjoyment on their own? Are they able to access, uh, access those things? What supports might they need in those areas? And then the last one in our example breakdown is daily living skills. So these would be things like uh, grooming, uh, grocery shopping, uh, toileting, going to the doctor, going to the dentist, depending upon the age and, and what those expectations are, uh, self-help, self-care type skills um, and things that they engage in on a regular basis. All right, other things that we need to factor in besides what kind of area and where we're identifying um, goals is we need to think about generalization and maintenance. So generalization means that the skill is going to be taught in, under one set of conditions and that the individual can generalize it and use it under other conditions. So they could generalize and use that skill with people who didn't teach them, with materials that were not used in teaching, in settings that were not used in teaching. And you might have generalization in like the wording or phrasing of both the questions and the answers, right? So generalization means that I can do it slightly differently from way it was taught also. Maintenance means that that skill is maintained and retained over time. So I learn it and I can demonstrate it, but then I can also do it again in a few weeks or a few months or when it comes up that that skill is needed. It's not something that is sort of forgotten or, or um, uh, falls out of the repertoire because it's not um, because it's not being taught anymore. So when we are writing programs, we need to plan for generalization and we need to plan for maintenance um, because not every learner is going to automatically generalize or automatically maintain a skill. So you wanna have a plan 
for those things. Um, generalization plans um, often include like once they meet the initial target, then we're going to start varying these aspects and we're going to continue to take data to make sure that they are still successful across this variety. Um, and if not, then we'll go back and we'll do some additional teaching and supports in that piece. Um, maintenance is often about incorporating the skill into the natural environment or into the um, into other skills that the learner is using on a regular basis or having a schedule to continue to practice this skill on a regular basis until it is incorporated into um, a, a regular routine or into other skills that um, get practiced on a regular basis. So you need to write that stuff out. It doesn't happen automatically. And we need to think about how are we going to help this learner generalize if we need that, if they need that support um, later once they learn this task. So there's an example there. Um, uh, generalization procedures um, you might have uh, people learn from different people in your teaching, um, practice across different environments, use a wide range of materials, uh, run the program with different SDs, and vary the way that the learner can respond. Um, maintenance, you want to have a schedule or embed these skills into other skills. Um, so when you're writing a program, um, you need to include um, enough detail and certain information so that everybody who supports the individual will be able to conduct the teaching plan in the same way. Now, this particular uh, example here that I have um, with these definitions is what I have used with insurance funders for several years and it, it ticks their boxes. It's a lot of information, but it ticks the boxes for the funders. Um, some funders may not require all of this information, but I think that spelling everything out in detail is very helpful, um, not just for funders because you have to tick a box, um, but more importantly, so that everyone really understands how to support the individual and everyone can be consistent in implementing um, these strategies because we want consistency in order to help our learners um, learn most efficiently. Um, and on topic 21, we're going to talk about fidelity of implementation. Topic 20, we're going to talk about progress monitoring. So having a really good detailed plan and having everything spelled out can reduce the likelihood that you are going to run into problems later with people, I didn't know what you meant, or, well, I'm running it this way, but this other person's running it that way. Like it can reduce some of those possible teaching errors in the future and make it easier and more efficient for the learner because we are being more consistent because we have a very specific detailed plan. So the domain is the first piece. It's going to be the curricular area under which this falls. That could be the social communication behavior. If you're going by a medical model, it could be the domains that we talked about. It could be domains from a specific assessment, but there's a domain. So I might say these are communication skills. Then I'm going to have my target response or my, my subdomain. Um, this is going to be specifically what am I teaching? I'm going to teach greetings or I'm going to teach um, requesting or mans or labeling or whatever I'm targeting, right? Then we have our response definition. So this is, this is your operational definition. Um, 
uh, written uh, as the operational definition of exactly what the behavior will be and under what conditions it will occur. So you go back to one of our earlier topics or lots of our earlier topics and look up the operational definitions, but you need to have a verb, you need to have a start and a stop, you need to have the where, when, and with whom. And those are the pieces that go into a really good detailed operational definition. So your plan, your, your program, your also needs to have that really detailed operational definition so that everyone is very clear about what we are working towards. Um, it's good to have the probe procedure. So this is basically um, defining how you would assess it, how you would conduct a probe. And oftentimes it's just the, the setup, the antecedent. I give you the where, when, and with whom, and let's see what you do, right? Like that's generally what your probe procedure is going to be. Mastery criteria. Um, so this is the level of, of the data performance that would be met before increasing the difficulty or the complexity or the generalization components of a skill. Um, sometimes people default to like the 80% across three days and two people, um, which isn't necessarily bad, but it needs to be relevant to your goal. If your goal is, um, five times a day, well, then 80% is not going to make any sense, right? If your goal is like a, a safety goal, um, where we don't want them to run across the street, um, then 80% is not acceptable, right? 100%. They should 100% not run across the street, right? So they should stop and look 100% of the time. So make sure that the mastery criteria makes sense for your goal, your operational definition, um, and, and don't default to 80% if that doesn't make sense. You know, maybe 90% or 95% is more appropriate for a certain skill, or maybe lower is more appropriate for a certain skill. Say it's a, a peer uh, social goal, and you go and you measure um, how often the peers are doing this goal, and they're only doing it 60% of the time, then don't set unreasonable expectations on your learner. Set the goal similar to their peers, 60% of opportunities. All right, so then the next piece is the teaching procedure. And this is going to be where all of your detail is. So this is going to be spelling out exactly how someone is supposed to support the individual, what prompts, what fading strategy, um, if you're using an error correction procedure, what that would look like, um, which when we talked about consequence strategies, um, my default for error correction is if they make an error, I say, oh, let's try again. And then we try again and I help them more, right? Like that is technically an error correction procedure, but I would want to write it in so that somebody else doesn't do something different. Um, I don't want somebody to jump in and say, no, that's wrong. So I'm going to say, look, if they make a mistake, here's what you do. You say, good try. Let's try again, right? So you have to spell out all those details. Spell out what the um, support person or the provider is going to do. What materials? How many? Um, what does it look like on the table? Um, what are they going to say? What are the exact words that they are going to use? What are the exact prompts and supports that they are going to use? How are they going to specifically fade out those supports over time? And at what point are they going to fade it out? So this is pulling together everything we've done from previous assignments into these teaching procedures, like tell me exactly how to do it. Give me a step-by-step -step list of how to support this individual so that we can all be consistent and our learner can get consistent support so that they can learn more efficiently. And then we can start varying things out in our generalization and maintenance. The next section is on the measurement procedure. So this is where you are going to define how you're going to collect the data. So 
if the learner does this, this is what I'm going to mark. If the learner does this, this is what I'm going to mark. If I do this, this is what I'm going to mark. And make sure that your measurement procedure will give you your mastery criteria. So if I am taking per opportunity data, but my mastery criteria is a rate, like that doesn't make sense, right? You need to make sure that all of these things match, that the operational definition, the mastery criteria, and the measurement procedure are all talking about counting the same thing in the same way. Um, then you also want to include uh, under measurement procedure, like how this is going to be graphed, um, how, uh, how you're going to use this, right? So not just record a plus or a minus, could they do it? But then, um, you know, what are we going to graph? We're going to highlight the pluses or we're going to highlight the percentage of pluses across the session. Um, if you're using electronic data collection systems, it might do the graphing automatically, um, but it's still good to define what's going to count towards that percentage, um, percent correct versus what's not going to count towards the percent correct. And then we have our maintenance and generalization. So just like we talked about, you've got to spell it out. This is where you need to define what does maintenance and generalization for this skill, for this learner look like, and at what points are you going to move to different maintenance and generalization goals? All right, so for the assignment, uh, write an operational definition for a skill to teach um, at least one thing within each of the eight common domains of behavior. Um, that's what I asked for just because we've defined those out. If you are conducting an assessment with a learner, maybe use uh, the domains from the assessment. Um, if you are uh, writing for um, medical model insurance funded services, then maybe you're using uh, social communication and behavior as your domains. Um, but uh, at least eight, like practice writing programs, because the only way you're going to get better and more fluent at this is by practicing uh, writing these programs. And, and they can take a while to put a lot of detail and make everything cohesive. Um, so have a learner in mind. Start by writing the operational definitions and placing those in the domains. And at that point, that's where you want to get feedback from your supervisor. Um, if you want to put them in the comments, I can give you feedback too. But we want to make sure that we have good operational definitions because everything else builds from an operational definition. Once you've got the operational definition, then you're going to write out a teaching program. And it's going to include everything. It's going to include the domain, the subdomain, the operational definition, your probe procedure, your uh, teaching procedure, including reinforcement schedule, prompting, fading, data collection, mastery criteria, plans for generalization and maintenance, like everything. And it's going to be big. And the reason that I have people write out all of these details is because if you practice writing out all of the details, then in the future, if you don't need to include some of those details for whatever reason, it's a lot easier to omit something that you know how to do than it is to, if you need more detail later, to try and go back and add something that you've never practiced. So practice writing all of the details, write really detailed, comprehensive programs get feedback on those. Um, and then that way you are better equipped to explain those details and write that level of detail in the future if you need to include that level of detail. So that is the assignment. As always, if you would like feedback, if you would like to put answers or you have questions or comments, please comment below. Subscribe if you want to have uh, notifications about um, more of these topics as we come up. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.